Hello, hello everyone. My name is Bonnie and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to be doing a long awaited video, at least for me, because I've been putting it off y'all i've been putting it off but that is my reading wrap up for february and march so this is going to be a lot of books so definitely like get a snack chill out grab a blanket you know just just vibe with me as i talk about all of the books i read between these two months um i made the decision to combine these wrap ups because february just really wasn't it for me i did not have very many good reads so I was like you know what I want to talk about some more happy things as well as the underwhelming books I read in February so here we are discussing both months so I will be starting off by talking about my February reads in February I really focused on trying to read a bunch of romance books I was just really in the mood for rom-coms and I wanted to tackle a few books that were on my TBR for a hot minute as well so I succeeded in both aspects but the ratings weren't that great but I will be starting off on a positive note. One of the books I read and really enjoyed in February was Act Your Age, Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the third and final book in the Brown Sisters trilogy. These are just like super cute and fun rom-coms. Um, each book, Get a Life, Chloe Brown, Take a Hint, Danny Brown, and Act Your Age, Eve Brown all follows one of the Brown sisters and kind of their shenanigans in facing life and growing up and falling in love unexpectedly. So I was very excited to get to this one in February, although like I was keeping my mind open because I had heard quite a few people were let down on this being the final installment and they definitely wanted more from it. So like I went in just expecting to have a fun time and I definitely did. This just had really great chemistry between the two love interests, Eve and Jacob, and just fun shenanigans. If you aren't familiar with the synopsis of Eve Brown, essentially Eve is trying to prove herself as an individual to separate herself from her parents and you know just prove she is a grown-up and can fend for herself. So she is desperate to find a job to just show her professionalism and prove she can achieve her goals and um, that leads her to a little B&B and, B. and Eve is quite chaotic. She jumps from job to job, she has a lot of talents but like she's never really stuck to one place while Jacob who is the head of the B&B &B, is very strict, very set in his ways. Everything must be like following a procedure, super strict in that aspect, but he is desperate for a chef for their B&B. &B. So at the interview they get off on the wrong foot because their personalities really clash and are the opposite, but Jacob is so desperate for um, a chef. He tries to chase after Eve after their interview goes wrong and she accidentally hits him with her car. Ah! So then things happen from there. Eve ends up crashing at the B&B &B as well as working there. So they have like squabbles, but the attraction is definitely there. And it's just so stinking cute. Um, this does have, I think, like two steamy scenes, which those... Good for Eve. <laughs> this was just super cute and fun. Um, I definitely wanted some more scenes of the relationship together once they were like officially going on and everything but there was a lot of fun scenes funny scenes just it's really endearing and it definitely felt like a hallmark netflix rom-com cuteness with it being like a little town b and b off on the wrong foot but then falling in love it was just it was it was very sweet definitely one i will want to reread again it was a four star just very cute very fun really uplifting and one of the shining lights of my February reads, that's for sure. Continuing along the romance train, I picked up The Hellions Waltz by Olivia Waite. This is a romance mass market paperback that I was wanting to try out because I've never really read any mass market paperback romances before and this is sapphic and I found it I think on Amazon when I was trying to look up some books that have heist in it. So I wanted to give it a try. And like, 
some aspects were good, others not so much. Essentially our plot line is one of our ladies, Madeline. She is kind of like a swindler con on the side seeking vengeance against this man who is kind of disenfranchised a lot of women and like small businesses. So to get back at him she wants to kind of run another con to I think steal his money and ruin his reputation. Um, and then our other character, Sophie, is a pianist, also like an instrument tuner, teacher, that sort of thing. But she has a history of someone um, kind of swindling her family at their previous place of employment and previous hometown. They've since moved. So Sophie kind of has a distrust for anyone that seems insincere and she kind of picks up on some bad vibes going on with Madeline. It's like, you will not ruin this. I will not let you ruin someone the way I've been ruined, reputation ruined, that sort of thing. So there is fun elements of this, but um, overall the actual con it's really not even a heist, honestly. Um, really felt very lacking, especially for the plot to really hinder on that. I did really enjoy the attraction the girls had toward each other. Like, I definitely felt that, believed that. But talks of love at the end and the wrapping up of the con at the end, I was like, no, that's not believable. No, not really. So. I ended up giving this one a three star. I don't think I'll be returning to this one. The next romance book I read in February was the one romance audiobook I tried out. I've never really read romance audiobooks before, so it was a new experience. And unfortunately, it was kind of a bad one, but I read the stand-in by Lily Chu. This I had access to via, via the Audible Plus catalog. Um, and it was narrated by Philippa Sue, who is Eliza in Hamilton. I had so many issues with this book. Um, it was part of one of my romance reading vlogs, so if y'all saw that, you'll know my struggles with this book. I gave it two stars. I wanted so much more from this and it really wasn't it. The main premise is that it is a character swap moment. Um, our main character is low on income and wanting to get her mom into a much better nursing home care facility than she currently is in and she's kind of out of a job as well so she's like walking on the street one day and then a car pulls up and there is two celebrities in it and right away they're like you you look you look like this famous actress Fang Li you should switch you should switch she needs a break <laughs> so oh I remembered our main character her name is Gracie so Grace is like, yeah, I need money. Let's do it. So they switch and she has to go to like all these like, like photo shoots and interviews and events and that sort of thing. But she is clearly not cut out for this gig at all. She's like clumsy, doesn't know her stuff and just, <sighs> and to top it off, then she's like super into Fong Lee's BFF actor friend, um, Sam which Sam is like totally against Gracie doing this swap. Every time she is in a room with him, she's like, oh, I hate him, but he is so hot. And it's like, girl, what is, you're not building chemistry for me if all you're saying is he's attractive. Where is the actual interaction to show the chemistry? Like, I'm not seeing it. They take ages to figure out why Gracie and Fong Lee look alike. I'm like, girl, this famous, actress you're telling me she does not try to do genetics or background searches literally within discovering someone looks like you i don't know about that there's also elements discussing mental health struggles which i it just made me really angry um fong lee is very clearly suffering from depression like very very severely like she just wants to stay locked up in her room can't really like motivate herself to leave she like they talk about her visually looking so unwell and Gracie's like oh yeah I've experienced that I've experienced that oh yeah I feel that and talks about how connected they feel yet Gracie continues to focus on her attraction towards Sam and going to these events and then suddenly feeling insecure when Fong Lee is like off in the background like at her lowest point I'm like 
help your friend out. You say your friends, you say your besties, you're like totally connected, then help her out. Just the logic of it just didn't make sense. I just can't even. I was so disappointed in this book. I really wanted to love it. I think the character swap trope is super fun and literally has the potential to be like something fun and crazy and silly and it just wasn't. The other mass market paperback romance I picked up was How to Find a Princess by Alyssa Cole. Um, this one was pretty boring and I was shocked about it. Um, like the the back of this sounded like it was gonna be so much fun. They're trying to find an heir to a royal bloodline. It's supposed to be set on the high seas. Hijinks are supposed to happen. There's supposed to be a crew of lovable weirdos on this adventure and it's kind of like a bodyguard princess romance in a way. So I was like, okay, all these tropes, all these elements sound fantastic. It's sapphic, high seas, like this will be so captivating, so fun. And it just wasn't. Like there's like one sexy scene of barely any flirting and it just, <sighs> the ending as well, just came out of nowhere and just changed everything we've been told and that was just not for me. And it even says there's a one bed trope. I, I disagree. I disagree. There is one bed, but the one bed trope is totally ignored like literally the entire time until they are already sexual with each other. So it's like, no, that does not have the tension, the close intimacy of sharing one bed of, oh, well, they won't they, oh, you know, they're going to wake up cuddling or whatever. That does not happen. It does not happen. So. I was disappointed once again but I gave it three stars because I was like okay I was very disappointed but like I enjoyed the beginning and I enjoyed the the explorations of both of our main characters being extreme extremely giving to their past partners so having to kind of be like hey we deserve that as well and just being like equal in the relationship. I did really enjoy that element and some elements of family that is discussed in here as well. So I was like, no, there is more fun, positive things going on in here than, than in the stand. And I was like, comparing that to this, this is definitely a three star. The next book I picked up in February was one of the books that has been on my TBR for quite a few years now, but that is A Curse So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmerer. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling that is centered on our two main characters, Harper and Wren. Um, Wren is this cursed prince um, and heir to this um, magical realm. Um, he's cursed to turn into a beast, I think, like at the end of every season. If I'm remembering correctly he was cursed by a witch um because he like he like slept with her and then he like brushed her off so then he got cursed um so to break his curse he has to have a woman fall in love with him so his essentially his bodyguard gray is able to travel to different realms to try and bring women there to fall in love with ren so one day gray is within our world and is like essentially kidnapping a woman from a club. Our main character Harper sees this and goes and attacks Grey with like a tire iron or something and when they're like fighting each other Grey transports them into the magical realm and Harper is then stuck there and a will they won't they moment happens. I just didn't get this book. I never got like really sucked in. Um, it does essentially start to be very like politically focused of like oh Ren's people are suffering oh there's people using different royal names to like raid places and everything and I don't know and then they, they start having the logic of oh Harper is a princess of our world and that's why she's important in their world and uh, just meh just meh. The one element I did really enjoy was the cerebral palsy rep in this. Um, I just really liked the 
discussions that were had. I discussed this in my reading vlog as well but I do have a cousin with cerebral palsy and um, even just like the mention in here of um, Harper is familiar with horseback riding because that was like a past therapy thing she had done for her cerebral palsy. My cousin did that in the past as well so I was like oh that's like a really cute way to kind of integrate that rep so I really enjoyed that element and the discussions had there. It was just really great to see but every other kind of fantastical and plot element just really fell flat for me. Um, I didn't really care about Harper and Ren that much at all. I think the most interesting was Grey, but even then I wasn't that impressed with him either. Um, so I just gave this one three stars because I kept just being like, what am I missing? What am I not experiencing that so many people have loved? Like, what, what is it? Um, so I mean, we'll see if I continue with book two because I have heard we do get Grey's perspective in that book, but for now I'm thinking this might be be my end for this trilogy unfortunately. The next book I picked up was The Midnight Girls by Alicia Yashinska. This is a fantasy book, um, another sapphic read, um, that is centered on this world that there are witches and there are like monster girls they use to capture people's hearts to bring back to the witches to power them and our two main characters are two of these monster girls they are rivals and are competing to capture a prince's heart um like literally rip it out of his chest for medicinal magical properties i really love the concept execution left me wanting. I felt like the magic system kept changing what it's capable of doing. Um, uh, so our two girls, Marinka and Zosha. Zosha is out for the heart for herself. She has experienced consuming hearts and she knows it makes her more powerful. So she is supposed to have more magical experience, more power, while Marinka has consistently been like losing to Zosha in the race for hearts and like seems a little more inconsistent with her magic but we know this and then other scenes are showing like their equality in magic and I'm like does that make sense? I don't think so. There's also like another side plot line of like the prince and like apparently his soulmate but like his soulmate betrayed him so like they're off on the outs and but he's trying to like protect the prince it's just there's a lot of stuff trying to go on here and I was like I just wanted like like a really fun sapphic romance of monster girls and you kind of get that but you never actually see them together it's more of like they they eventually realize they're into each other but it takes ages. Parts of this I really enjoyed. There are definitely portions where I'm like okay yeah we're making sense now this is making sense and then things would refute things as well so it's just ugh. I just wish this maybe was like a series rather than a standalone and we could develop these relationships this world more. So I unfortunately had to give this one three stars as well. But this one I do think I will revisit. Perhaps on a reread I will enjoy this more since I now have an understanding of like the light fantastical elements, the light sapphic vibe of this. Yeah, it's definitely more of a vibe, more of an energy than like a fully fleshed out romanticized um, relationship. So kind of here and there about it. The next one is yet another TBR veteran and that is the Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. This book, God, I honestly don't know how many years I've owned this. Maybe five? Maybe eight? I don't know. I don't know. I picked it up ages ago knowing it is in a mythology retelling, obviously focused on Achilles and it is gay. So I've always kind of assumed this would be a five star, especially hearing about how much love it receives on YouTube. But I was so let down. I don't know what happened and also I don't know what what I missed, what, what people see that I, I missed. Um, this is the retelling of the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus throughout their lives ever since they were little boys and into their like young adulthood. 
um, and the Trojan War as well. Um, Patroclus, I liked him. I liked him. I did. Achilles, not so much. Um, but Patroclus is um, growing up as a child and he just kind of lets everyone down. He is not the He's not the boy everyone expected him to be with being a prince and the heir to his father's throne and so like he's kind of living constant life being looked down upon um and is just quite unhappy and is constantly bullied despite being the prince um so one day when a bully is getting particularly bad patroclus defends himself and unfortunately he kills that boy he gets disinherited and sent off to a different kingdom which is the kingdom of achilles's father and they start growing up together. Patroclus at first is like totally against Achilles uh, because Achilles is literally everything Patroclus's father wanted him to be, expected him to be. He's the golden boy that is good at everything. But Achilles takes an interest in Patroclus, takes him under his wing, and they eventually form a friendship that grows into something more. So they like go off on various adventures, various locations in their world and their their bond just solidifies and they they fall in love. Um, Achilles' goddess mother is a very against Patroclus being around um, and people just keep wanting Achilles to become part of the war and Achilles is against it, he wants to stay with Patroclus, that's all that really matters. But ultimately, he does get sucked into the Trojan War to get Helen back after she gets stolen by Paris. Don't get me wrong, I, I enjoy Greek mythology a lot. But a retelling, I feel like, is the opportunity to flesh out these characters more, explore the stories, um, just really deep dive into it. And that just never happened for me. It felt like we're like floating above it all, which you could you could argue is intentional because it's a retelling from Patroclus's perspective, but mm, also if that's true, then why did I dislike Achilles so much if it's coming from Patroclus's perspective? who literally adores him and would do anything for him. I loved Perseus though, when she shows up and she like tells, and she tells Achilles off um, a time or two, I'm like, this great, th this great woman, she's wonderful, she's wonderful. So maybe I should look into if there's any other retellings with her. Perhaps, perhaps. But this just ended up being a three star. I was incredibly let down, but I do think there is value in this. Um, Madeline Miller does an excellent job of making this story approachable for people who aren't familiar with mythology. Like if this is your first book to try out and discover mythology, I think it is very accessible, very, very easy way to wrap your mind around these kind of complex ancient tales. The next audiobook I picked up was All Systems Read by Martha Wells. This is the first novella in the Murderbot Diaries series. I picked up the audiobook through my library because I've heard really good things about this series for quite a few years and for quite a few years now and I definitely agree with the hype. Um, this is like a sci-fi novella series although I think one or two installments are actually a full novel now um, but this follows the um, main character of Murderbot, who is um, artificial intelligence but also has like organic parts as well so he does deal with like human anxiety and emotions and concerns but has the mind of you know computer AI. Um, so most of his understanding of humans he's picked up through watching like old old comedy shows, old just like entertainment shows, entertainment feeds. Um, so like he has a very sarcastic and humorous look on life um, but like also anxieties as well and then sci-fi things happening and it's really interesting, very intriguing. I loved this first installment. It just really kickstarts right away into some sci-fi moments. Um, I think they're like fighting off an enemy or something and Murderbot's past is questionable of what his past deeds were and who he is um, 
and who he is loyal to now because he has like the ability to overwrite things in his system um to like make himself more sufficient but he then becomes kind of like an independent not following the rules and regulations per se so very interesting and i'm very excited to see where the story goes from here um so it's funny and engaging and really atmospheric i was so surprised by this novella so i gave it five stars because it was great it was great highly recommend then the next two i have to discuss are both um ebooks i read uh, smutty me smutty ebooks um you know as I do sometimes. Um, Feast of Sparks by Sierra Simone. This is the second book in, I believe it's called the Thorn Chapel series. I'll, I'll uh, pop up a picture here and um, the, the first book as well because I can't remember what it's called. But this is like a dark romance, polyamorous, but also kind of like whimsical dark magic going on as well. There is a mystery of this like thorn chapel estate with like past ritual things going on um a lot of people are just like into each other both like all of them are into each other but then there's also like specific groupings as well um i really enjoyed the first book and so i wanted to continue on the second book i enjoyed parts but it was like getting more taboo and I was like eh, I don't know how I feel about this but Sierra Simone knows how to write smut so if that's what you're looking for maybe you do want to try these out but it is definitely dark and complex and I think the series is just getting darker as they're getting more information on these past rituals um, going on so I think I gave this one three stars if I'm remembering correctly. Book one did a good job of balancing the relationships and learning about these rituals. Book two was a little unbalanced so I'm not too sure of where it's going from here um, but there is like some elements of mystery left to this um, creepy chapel thing so We'll see where we go from here. The other smutty book I read was A Lady of Rooksgrave Manor by Catherine Moon. This is a monster smut book. Um, it's essentially a reverse harem where all these girls have male suitors that are of the monster variety. So you got, uh, you got vampires, you got um, Invisible Man, uh, you have like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde character. There's like a, a Sphinx man or something. There's like creepy lake creatures I don't know there's like so many different monsters and uh our main character she's she just loves having sexy times with the men's so she's living her best life <laughs> Catherine Moon she knows how to write smut good for her um but the areas where it's attempting to have a plot I didn't really know how much I built into it because like some random evil dude starts to like attack the manor and then starts to target our main character and and all the all of her men get very protective so it's like eh, there's squabbles amongst them me eh. um and then i felt like it started talking about love too soon in my opinion um but once again gave it three stars you know it was a, it was a mildly fun time so why not and then the final book i have to share for my february reads was it Happened One Summer by Tessa Bailey. This definitely was my favorite romance read of February. I just really adored this um, and it does have kind of like the grump sunshine vibe to it. Our main character Piper is a socialite whose character is actually based on Alexis from Schitt's Creek. Um, so she discovers that her birth father who died when she was young um, owned a bar in this small fishing town and her stepfather is wanting to you know clean up his image get her to stop being a crazy party girl show responsibility so he makes her go to this fishing town and clean up the bar to like prove herself and her sister goes along with her she meets brandon who is a grumpy fisherman not liking change very much but he's definitely attracted to her um he has some complex things going on of um being a widow i believe his wife passed away like five years ago so he is very much a loyal man and feeling 
feels like he can't act on any future relationship or anything just sticking with his pattern of life and then Piper blows into town and kind of shakes everything up um they they're attracted to each other feelings develop romance develops Woo, is there good smut in here oh my <laughs> is very cute there's funny moments endearing moments i will say i didn't love the like squabble that always happens at the end of romance books but like once i stepped back and really thought about it and piper does not have experience of having long lasting romantic relationships i think she said her longest relationship was like three weeks maybe or was it three months i don't remember it was a short time and um he hasn't been in a relationship for a very long time um and just like the insecurities of her coming from this like crazy party life and him just being a fisherman who is constantly going on dangerous fishing trips there's like the anxiety that they were both having i was like okay it does make sense why this would put a strain on your relationship overall this was super cute and fun i really adored it i gave it five out of five stars the only thing i wish is that we saw a little more time of them together but there is like a sequel spin-off book following Piper's sister Hannah so maybe we'll get to see this couple in that one as well being like cute and they're happily ever after hope so but I was just so glad to get another five star in with all of those three stars of February okay so it is now time to kick off the books I read in March which it definitely had like an uptick in star ratings this month so yay so the first book i completed is delilah green doesn't care by ashley herring blake oh my god i fell head over heels for this book i loved it so much i just love this lady on the cover it's stunning stunning um so obviously i gave this five out of five stars it's just so cute and endearing and fun and just rom-com loveliness i could definitely see this being like a netflix rom-com for sure just so many of the scenes character interactions felt so cinematic so like in the scenes i could like see it so well it was just amazing so the premise of this is that Delilah Green is a aspiring photographer um, pursuing her career in New York. She gets called up by her stepsister to come in photograph her wedding. So Delilah Green has to travel back to her childhood home, which she does not have good memories of. Um, she um, experienced the loss of her father, was often bullied or avoided as a kid, and really does not want to deal with her stepmom deal with like the old snobs of her past life but she feels obligated also she could use that money um so she heads on back and when she comes into town she heads to the bar to meet up with her sister and her sister's two best friends um they aren't all there yet it is just claire and their other friend at the time and we learn that Claire is a single mother, hasn't really pursued any relationships in a hot minute other than like falling back in with her ex for a fling or two. And so her friend was like, okay, let's get you back out there, wet your feet, you know, just try to get someone's number tonight, okay? So Claire sees Delilah walk into the bar. She does not realize it is Delilah. So she goes over there and is like flirting and stuff and Delilah knows it's Claire so she's like oh shit oh shit my old crush is flirting with me and she does not realize I'm her best friend's stepsister you love you love the energy of that and then and then the stepsister Astrid shows up and then they put two and two together and Claire is very embarrassed but now there's already the already the energy of Delilah knows Claire is into her and Delilah has had past feelings for Claire. So many elements, it's already like, ooh, sapphic goodness. You love it, you love it. Um, and then there's wedding shenanigans of um, all the friends of Astrid do not like her fiance. All kind of form a team in a way to kind of try and split it up the the couple or just help Astrid realize that like her fiance is kind of an asshole so just 
it's complex, it's wonderful, it's so cute, it's so fun, it's heartwarming, it's emotional. It nearly made me cry quite a few times. I just, I adored it. And these characters felt so incredibly real. I think it's like the most real feeling characters I've ever experienced. Um, you know, with, often with rom-coms it's like light and fluffy and just like cuteness but they're kind of like caricatures very similar to one another but these felt like real women with real problems and just trying to grow and better themselves and better themselves together it was just it was divine and i loved it so fabulously done i cannot wait for the sequel spin-off um i think it's called astrid parker doesn't fail um but I'm excited to see where the relationships go from there. I'm hoping we get to see more cute moments with Claire and Delilah because I'd love them together. Also y'all, there is a successful one bed trope in this. So heck yeah. The next audiobook I picked up was Artificial Condition by Martha Wells, which is book two of the Murderbot Diaries. And I was a little let down on this one. Um, it's just very situated in a different situation. Wow. Wow, way for me to just talk a circle right there. <laughs> Murderbot finds himself um, kind of interacting with other computer intelligence and he's kind of on the run from people but also like trying to find people. It felt pretty convoluted to me so I enjoyed the humorous elements once again because Murderbot is also like sharing his like favorite entertainment feeds with this other like computer intelligence thing so that was amusing, that was fun and some fun interactions, conversations, but it just left me wanting more, um, which I'll definitely continue with this series, but just I expected a little more for how much I loved um, the first installment. After that, I picked up the short story collection of Summer Palace by C.S. Picat. This is a collection of the short stories in the Captive Prince world. Um, some of them are after the trilogy or in between books as well. They're all kind of compiled into this one and I ended up giving this one three stars. Some stories were definitely stronger than others. My favorite one being the Summer Palace which is the getaway that Damon and Laurent agree to take once their kingdoms are settled after all the shenanigans in the concluding book. So there are cute moments. We do get to see more relationship development um, but some of these were like two star, some three. So overall it was a three star, but I'm happy to have the Summer Palace story because that was really cute. Now this next little portion, I, I went crazy with the manga this month, I guess. Um, but I had been hearing very good things, particularly from Katie Coulson's channel, um, regarding Spy X Family by Tatsuya Endo. This is a fantastic manga series um, that is following our main character who is a master spy and he is assigned on a mission to get access to a man who could potentially start World War III and the one way he can get access to him is via a private children's school. So his mission is to get a child and get a wife and join the boarding school and kind of get intel on this nefarious man. So, so he gets a child. She's so adorable. And a wife. She's a queen. And they they form a fake family. But like also the chemistry y'all. The chemistry is so fucking good. So he is a spy really good at disguises. The daughter he adopts is actually a telepath. So she knows he is a spy but he does not know she is a telepath. And the wife he gets is secretly an assassin. So we have like this cute sweet little girl who knows he spies and does crazy missions and knows that her mother murders people for a living. So it is fantastic. It is fantastic. I loved it. I ate up all three of these mangas in March. It is heartwarming with the 
found family elements of it. There is humorous moments. There are great action sequences. It is gory at times because, you know, she's an assassin. Um, but it's just great. I adore all of these characters. It is so fun. I love the art style. Like, the art style on these covers are also the same art style within. It is beautiful. I love it so much. Um, and I was literally obsessed. Volume 1 was 5 stars, of course. Absolutely amazing. Volume 2 I gave 4 stars and then Volume 3 I gave 5 stars again. I just read these like crazy to, to, to the point where I was ravenous to get my hands on the other volumes. Um, unfortunately I couldn't get the physical copies of them right away but these are as you can see the little SJs on them. They are part of the Shonen Jump um, so if you get like the app or access to their website you can sign up with them to pay I believe it's like $1.99 a month. Um, that's in US dollars for me. Um, and you can read a heck ton of manga chapters um, each month. So I literally got to access everything that has been since translated in this series. And I went off, y'all. I went off. I read, I read volume four and volume five and volume six and volume seven and volume eight and volume nine. <laughs> I went crazy and I loved it. Volume volume four was four stars, volume five, four stars, six, four stars, seven, I think I gave it three stars, but upon reflection, I think it is a four star. And volume eight, I gave five stars and volume nine, I believe I gave four stars. So uh, some fluctuation there, but I really, adore where the story is going from here. We just have such fun banter and adventures. It is hilarious. I'm literally making so many of my friends read this series as well. And I've been slowly but surely getting my hands on the other manga physical copies of the volumes. Only up to volume seven is out. They've all been ordered or are in my possession now, but are passed along to friends to read but I just, I'm obsessed. Also, there is an anime coming literally like tomorrow, I think, and I just, I literally can't wait to see the adaptation. It just, it is my favorite manga series ever. Like, I just, it has so much going for it and I absolutely adore it. Then the next two manga I have to talk about is Sailor Moon Eternal Edition Volume 8 and Sailor Moon Eternal Edition Volume 9. Um, so both of these, I believe I gave like, three stars or it might have been this was four and this was three kind of hard to remember a lot of the sailor moon volumes kind of blur together of what's been going on in them but still really enjoying this series i literally only have one volume left which is absolutely crazy to me um but like they're a fun time they're a cute time i love these characters and the shenanigans they get up to sometimes it's quite repetitive with the elements of the villains that are used or the the ways they fight or the way certain scenes are drawn but it's just very endearing and I really enjoy it. I really do think I gave this one three stars with it being the penultimate volume I thought there would be a little more to it leading up to the final volume but we'll see maybe maybe things will go batshit crazy in the final volume and then this being a little more mellow makes perfect sense but Happy for the progress I've made on this series. Then the final manga I have to discuss is one my friend lent me because she really wanted me to read um, all of them that are currently out, but I only got to volume one. Um, but that is Cherry Magic, volume one. Um, 30 years of virginity can make you a wizard. Um, so this is like a very silly but cute manga um, about our main character who when he turns 30 he is a virgin and hasn't really had any serious relationship at all and discovers if he touches someone he can hear their thoughts and so he is at work one day and interacts with um, one of his co-workers and discovers that his very popular um, and outgoing co-worker has a very deep crush on him so there's just like fun aspects of that of like being overwhelmed discovering someone's got a crush on you but also fun shenanigans and there's just like cute relationship growing um i gave this volume three stars but i really like the potential it has and i'm intrigued to see where the story goes from here and then the final 
chunky book I read in March was Kingdom of Ash by Sarah J Maas. I'm very happy that I finally finished this series um, but this was also a three star for me. There was just it was so slow at the beginning and a lot of the characters were making questionable decisions. The characters didn't necessarily feel knowable in this book, um, especially our main character. Just Selena in book one, then throughout the series, changes so much but not in a way that feels like development to me. It feels like a, we don't know what the heck she's gonna do. Mm. I liked the, the battles we were seeing. Um, the death decisions in this, I was like, really? You're doing that to those people? Really? So parts of this I enjoyed. I enjoyed the magic. I enjoyed some of like the world coming together. Um, but like the just the logic was extremely lacking for me and just mm, um so not my favorite, but happy to complete it and it definitely like started to pick up for me. Um I really enjoy uh, Lorcan and Elide's moments. I think uh, Kaol and Irene had some sweet moments as well. I just don't give a shit about Rowan. <laughs> but I did it. I did it. I defeated this chunker. Wahoo. So these are all of the books I read in, in February and March. Oh boy, was that a lot to go through. So thank you so much for sticking it out with me if you are still here. Um, in the comments, I would also love to know what books really stood out to you in February and March. What were your highlights? Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. I'm gonna head on out. So once again, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.